Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Revely. Oh, wow. Do I have a show for you today? Because I've got somebody who is across the waves who's made it here today to tell you about some really exciting things that she's doing. She's been a model, an actress, screenwriter, producer, author, public speaker, opioid addiction advocate, spiritual gangster, and more. There's a lot to tell with what she's got going uh, with her demonstrated history of working in branding, marketing, advertising. She's got skills in negotiation, writing, which is her passion. And I can understand that and identify with it because I love to write too. There's so much that her and I share, and you're gonna find out that here on the show today as well. But she loves marketing, advertising, film and documentaries, which we're gonna talk about something that she's doing today. Not only that, but she's graduated from the American College of Journalism, the National Guild of Hypnotists, and the National Federation of Neurolinguistic Programming. And we're going to talk about these things because of how paramount they are with what she's doing. And we are going to specifically talk about her film, The 16 Movie. Welcome to the show. I'm so excited. I am just absolutely delighted to introduce you and have you here with me today, Jessica Gerlach. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Rebecca. What an amazing introduction. Thank you so much for that. Thank I, you for having me on the show. I am so excited to have you here because you, you are on the other side of the planet right now, here to yeah. be with us to share your passion and you have been working on this so hard to get it out there with what you're doing and this is really needed and all of the skills that you've amassed so far really bring it home to deliver it to people who need it thank you thank you so much i, I never realized how all of the skill set would actually come together but after about 20 years of just going on a search and trying different things and you know studying different things that I love, you know, now I'm, start, I'm seeing things come together in a really unbelievable way that I never could have imagined. So it's really rewarding to see that. I'm just absorbing all of this when I think about everything that you're doing and just embracing what you do because your passion, and this is really ironic, is epidemic. How do you like that with what you're doing? <laughs> clever <laughs> it's true <laughs> clever it okay. is <laughs> you think about it because and it needs to be because what you are doing right now with all of the things that you have done now I mean that up until now is really needed to address a huge problem that we are seeing not just in the United States but everywhere and when we talked off air, boy, did we have a, a really good conversation and a lot of things that we wanted to just touch upon and go further in depth. And we couldn't, we didn't even have enough time because it was there, but let's, just, let me, let's just go first at how you got to where you are so that we can really get into what you're tackling at the moment. So how I got to where I am professionally? Is yeah. That, okay. Well, like I said, so I've basically been on what I would call a 20 year journey to find myself and my purpose. I've always been a person very connected to spirituality and energy. And I've multiple times in my life, you know, I would just kind of take a step back and feel like I wasn't doing enough. So all of the things that I love to do, like writing and journalism and hypnosis and all of this type of stuff. I mean, it's all works with the mind and it's also creative. And I would say that that sums me up pretty well. Uh, somebody who thinks a lot, maybe too much, <laughs> um, but also believes in the power of the mind, but is also extremely creative and absolutely necessary for me to have a creative outlet for me to be the best version of myself. So I would say just 
dabbling in all the different things that I've been interested in have opened new doors, moving around. You know, I, I grew up in a small town in upstate New York and I moved to New York City when I was 18. I was in acting school, dance, you know, theater, all of that. And uh, a few years after that, I ended up moving to Toronto for 10 years. And now I'm in Serbia for seven. So that journey literally led me around the world, but also opened up new professional doors for me. Um, but interestingly enough, I still work very closely with some of my best friends back home, Gerald Barclay being one of them, who I worked on the 16 film with. And he's the one that actually um, presented this project to me. He, he didn't have time for it, so he asked me to develop the concept for that. And I ended up writing the concept for what was supposed to be a short film, but quickly turned into a feature because I had so much material that I couldn't stop writing. And being a creative person that I, that I am, you know, my mind saw so many different scenarios that I could incorporate into the project. So when I handed it back to him, he was just like, wow. He was like, we're going to have to make this into a feature. And I said, yeah, I think you're right. So that's how that ended, um, ended up happening. But prior to that, we wrote a book um, on his experience with Wu-Tang Clan. He grew up with the rap group. Um, and he also directed the first videos in the 90s. So we had written together just a few months. Uh, well, we finished the book just a few months before we started the 16 movie. So we've been working together for a good 20 years now. Oh, that's a long time. It is. I met him when I was 18 and I did my first film with him. But like I said, you know, the writing kind of always took over my life in some, in some way. So yeah, we've been, we've been uh, very good friends and working together for a very long time. So let's talk a little bit about the 16 movie because this is really crucial to changing lives. Absolutely. So the 16 movie tackles the opioid crisis in the United States. Um, our film specifically revolves around 16 year olds who recreationally use the drug. They end up, they first, they start out taking pills that they steal from their parents or their brother or sister. And then one by one, the whole group of friends who were once healthy, vivacious, high achieving teenagers, um, they each become addicted and, and the film literally shows the path of destruction that each of them lives out and it's all very different scenarios, but they're, they literally experience the dark underworld of heroin and fentanyl addiction um, inevitably. So it shows prostitution, overdose, HIV, murders, robbery gone wrong, murder, I mean, you name it, it's, it's in the film. Anything that can go wrong with a, with a nasty addiction like that, we portray a very real, intense, raw view of what that addiction looks like in action. So it's, it's intense. Well, I think this is really important because this is such a issue in our climate right now and it is all over the world but here in the united states it is definitely an issue it is from my experience in law enforcement i have come across and been told by users that it's cheaper to get than marijuana so that means the prevalence of it and the usage of it is astronomical and we don't see it. And interestingly enough, what you talked about in the very beginning with people getting just pills from their parents' cabinet and things like that, there's parties called farm parties that these teenagers are going to and they will bring pharmaceuticals from their household and just put them in a bowl and everybody just grabs one and just see what happens. And yeah. so... I think that we need to pay attention to what your film is bringing out because the realism is that this is here and parents need to be aware and those that are of the age where they're 
thinking about this, they have friends doing this, they need to know what is going to be happening or could potentially happen to them or to their friends. Exactly. It's yeah. real. It's very real. And they, and what I try to express when I speak to a group at an event or a college or a high school, wherever I'm speaking, especially when it comes to kids, you know, there's, there's no child who's, you know, 15 or 16, who's thinking I'm going to pop a couple pills today or tomorrow. And I'm going to be prostituting myself in six months because I need the drugs so bad and I have no money. People don't think like that. And it's very, very real. They'll do anything to, to not feel sick from the withdrawal. So that's one of the things that I really want to express to especially teenagers is that you have no idea how fast this can spin out of control. It's not like having a hangover. It's, it's not like something you can get over the next day. If you do it consecutively too many days in a row, you're going to be hooked. It's, yeah. it's a, a 100% chance of addiction. There's no escaping it. When we were always told that with heroin, it's a one time when you, once you have tried it, that desire to have that back is so strong. You're pretty much hooked from the first time. And the, people don't realize that that intensity from a one time, oh, I'm just going to try this can be that strong. And so it is not the heroin specifically is not like any other type of drug that's out there. There's something different that, and you would be the expert in this, especially with knowing about neuro and neuro linguistics, the changes that it makes in the brain to crave that so intensely off of one time. It's just absolutely devastating because like you said, people do not think, teenagers do not think, and anybody, any age that is considering, well, maybe I, you know, I want to just try this because everybody else says, hey, this is the greatest thing. You know, you got to check this out. They don't think about the consequences of what they might do. Right after they've done it, like prostitution or stealing or committing some other heinous event. Um, one thing I'm going to ask you, Jessica, is, and I don't know if you found this in your research, this is just something that I've kind of found, and I, maybe you'll talk about this and you can share this with us, with the audience now is methamphetamine use and the correlation to violent crimes such as active shootings. So maybe you can, if you know a little bit about that, you can share. I've been mostly focused on opioids for the last year and a half, but I do know a bit about methamphetamines. And I think that it just, again, it changes the brain chemistry. And every time you use any type of drug, it affects different people in different ways, but you do see some of the same things happening to the masses. And okay. so, the, and, and every time you use a drug, every time you have an experience, an emotional experience, a feeling, you're redirecting your neurotransmitters in your brain to different pathways. Yes. And this is, yeah. So you can literally be triggering different parts of your brain that have never been triggered before using especially synthetic drugs, but any drug. The synthetic ones are just outrageously worse, but any drug is going to redirect the neurotransmitters and it literally brings out a totally different person than the person that you might be sober. So, and you know, methamphetamine lasts for a really long time from what I understand and it's, it's just so highly addictive. And I think it, put, it puts certain types of people in a rage. Yes, and this this is the thing that I'm finding through my own research is that correlation of the rage. And so I think that this is really interesting that you're sharing that and the, the issue with the neurotransmitters because oftentimes we, we don't think about that, but yet in the same respect, we can look at someone and you will hear somebody, some scuttlebutt will say, the scuttlebutt meaning gossip, 
yeah. oh, you know, that guy looks like his brain's fried. And meaning that they've taken so many drugs that they cannot or have been on a certain drug for so long that they cannot think clearly, right? So right. there is something to this. And there's also called something called drug-induced psychosis. So Absolutely. I've been speaking to, about this lately to just to friends and exactly it's psychosis. So the, they, ca they can cause mental health issues down the road that you're not expecting to have. And that can be hearing voices doing things. Mean, there's just so many things that you don't anticipate happening from doing something. And somebody can do one drug for, say, a week and it not have a certain effect. You can do it once and that can be it for you. It, you can lose your That's life. True or you can have a bad reaction to it. Uh, you could be allergic or whatever. I mean, there, it, nothing is the same for everyone. And that's true. And, uh, yeah, go ahead. It, yeah. Sorry. I didn't mean, I didn't mean to interrupt, but it's just so amazing that you're touching on that topic because I do know of a few people who had cocaine induced psychosis. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, a lot of other people are fine on it and, it doesn't do anything hallucinogenic for them, but depending on the physiological state of a particular person, they can experience hallucinations and psychosis from, from cocaine as well. So like you said, it just depends on the person and everybody's different. Of course, like I said, there's the same effects on the mass as you see the, the, the general effects, but you never know if you're going to be one of them. It's just the same with, fentanyl or these synthetic drugs. Some kids, first time ever trying drugs, take a synthetic drug and it kills them instantly. I actually posted something about that on my Facebook today. It was a story of all the moms who lost teenage sons who experimented with synthetic drugs for the first time and it killed them instantly. So, so terrible. This is horrific. Yeah. I want to ask if you would share with the audience for those who are saying, okay, what's the difference between a drug and a synthetic drug? If you could clarify that so that when we're talking with those who don't about this, with those who don't really understand the difference, they can go, Oh, I get it now. Right. So basically the difference you see with a drug and a synthetic drug because even natural substances are still considered drugs. Um, the synthetic ones are man-made. They can just be made of chemicals. They're man-made and they're so unpredictable and they're just many thousands of times stronger than a drug like, okay, heroin, obviously the derivative is from the poppy plant. Um, it's a morphine based uh, drug, but you have fentanyl, which gives you the same feeling, but it's man-made and it's synthetic. And a lot of times now it's coming from China. So you have no idea what's in that. Well, and two, well, whoever the pusher is, the supplier on the street, they can lace it with different things. They can dip it in different things. I and mean, there's just different things. They can cut it. They can add things to it. There's different things that can be done with drugs. So you don't even know if what you're getting is the real deal, the pure thing. And that other additive could, could cause even more damage or, or could, so there's just too many what if factors here that can kill you. I mean, it just, I just have to say it like that because this is harmful and you're speaking on this you have the movie, the 16 movie. Now you're also going out and speaking. You have speaking engagements. You do speak here in the United States. Can you talk a little bit about that as well? Sure. So basically what we do at the screenings, well, there's, there's screenings and event, public speaking events. So if I'm talking about addiction, I always screen the 10 minute version of the 16. It's the trailer that we produced so far. And basically it tells the story in a, in a shorter nutshell version of the feature film that we're still working on. Um, so basically, we speak about all the statistics. We try to be very interactive with the audience because we like 
to get their feedback. And it's insane how, you know, you have, I don't know, usually 50% of the audience, maybe more, who raises their hand when you ask, who knows somebody who's been addicted to opiates? That's how high the statistics, I mean, it just goes to show you how many people are using it, that's whether it be. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely huge. It is, it is. Okay, so Jessica, we were talking about drug-induced psychosis, the different train changes with neurotransmitters. You have a lot of knowledge with how things work with neurolinguistics and hypnosis. Is there a way to kind of recovery, recover the neurotransmitters or with the use of NLP or hypnosis, sort of regain your abilities after having been affected by drugs? Yes. Well, yes, and I don't want to say no, but okay. you, know, you can't hypnotize a person who's unwilling. Okay, they have, okay. And they won't do anything that they're morally, deep down, morally not okay with. So if they want the help, and they use they choose the tool of hypnosis or okay. NLP, then absolutely it can be very effective because you are literally rewiring your brain with those those tools. And that's what I, I talk about in another different type of events is, is about rewiring your brain and making the choice to seek out the tools that work for you because we live in a world now where obviously knowledge is at our fingertips tips with um, the internet, obviously. So we can explore how many different tools to change our minds, to rewire our brains towards positivity or a healthier lifestyle or more confidence or, you know, the, the choice is really ours. It's just making the choice and seeking out the tools that work for you. You have to be dedicated to it. So unfortunately, you know, those addicted to opiates, it is a very high, it's a high relapse rate. I, I don't want to be negative, but it is. And I think that it is because of that, that euphoric feeling. But I also mm -hmm. truly believe that, I mean, I've seen a lot of research done and I've spoken to a lot of people that explain how this lack of emotional connection or a lack of bond with other human beings or maybe with their own families or just the ability to bond with others in general is where they're lacking. So that euphoric feeling to them is it just takes them on an escape and it kind of fills a void. I get so there's it. a lot more to it than just rewiring the brain. I think that it requires group work, spiritual work, of course, after rehab and, and all of the detox process and, and counseling, but I think there's so many other elements to it. That's my opinion. Like I said, different things work for different people and there's definitely not only one path to recovery. But this is important to know, not only for someone who is on the side of having used, but also for family members because they need to understand that the process for recovery isn't instantaneous and that the potential for relapse is there and that the the road to recovery is going to be a little bit longer of a process than what maybe they think is that that it's going to be and so if people understand that when they're working with someone that they love is going through a situation like that it's a little bit easier or more palatable to go through the process because you know you kind of know what to expect or that it's going to be a little bit more lengthy um, in that respect because you have to work with someone now who has different changes in the brain. And that's something that a lot of people don't understand. There's changes there. Yes. And, and so that, that is, that is something that I think a lot of people too tend to not realize when they go, well, why don't they just quit? And then everything goes back to normal. Yeah, unfortunately, it doesn't work like that. But somebody who's never been an addict or specifically an addict to opiates, they can't relate. It's like, why would you go back to it? Well, the way that they most addicts will describe it is it was just something 
stronger than them, just something mm -hmm. stronger than them that they couldn't control. So I think that it it's a lifelong struggle for them and it doesn't go away easily and it takes probably a lot of just ongoing self-development, self-discovery, self-love, and then like having a support group, choosing the best people to have in your life who affect you the best way. You know, there's so many layers. There's just mm -hmm. so many layers. There are a lot of amazing people who get that and they're trying to do something about it. Like I know a reverend who I talked about on another podcast, he takes in suicidal teens or young adults as well, I believe, who many of them are addicts. So suicide and opiate addiction, it's very, very closely related. Um, and of course, other addicts and suicide. I mean, you know, that's something that's related anyway, but he, he takes them in and tries to provide a really spiritually fulfilling environment for them, a very bonding, you know, support group. And it's just amazing what he described to me and his whole take on it. So he's actually the, one of the first people who opened my eyes to it, although I had read a lot of articles and things, but he's the first person that I talked to directly. So I just thought it was amazing what he was doing. And he really seems to know what he's talking about. He deals with them every day. That's, so. that's pretty neat. Now, do you offer any services like NLP to help with the treatment of addiction? So I, I'm mostly focused on hypnosis at the moment. Okay. I do use NLP in combination with hypnosis, okay. but I would say the piece of what I do is hypnosis. Um, but NLP is also really effective because you can interrupt negative patterns. It's a little complex to describe on a, um, you know, in a, in a short video, but it is really, really powerful and very effective. But I feel like for me, hypnosis kind of gets more, it gets to the root of a problem a little more, whereas NLP, that's not the focus. The focus is just interrupt the pattern. Whereas okay. with hypnosis, yeah, hypnosis is like, let's say you have a person who has a childhood trauma. You're going to want to take that person back to that vulnerable feeling of being a child and having them relive that, I mean, feel those feelings about being vulnerable. And then you're gonna to wanna to take them from that child and allow them and suggest to them that they're an empowered adult now. You plant seeds to them where they're an empowered adult now. So they're no longer a vulnerable child. So they now see this issue very differently mm -hmm. from a different perspective, but it's a process. That's just one example, but. Okay. Idea NLP doesn't work that way. So with NLP, then, which is, if I could just give it in a short kind of explanation, kind of tapping different areas of your body to retrain patterns or interrupt patterns that are going on, would that be then more effective for something like post traumatic stress disorder? I personally like the combination. I like the the use of both. Okay. Um, okay. But like we were saying before, different things work for different people. Uh -huh. So you might do both on somebody and they may even say that they prefer one over the other. It just works for them or feels better to them or everybody's different. So, and I think sometimes you can feel it out as well to see what, what they're responding to better than the other. But I love the combination and a lot of, a lot of practitioners use that together. They use both of them together. I think okay. it's more effective used together. But this is really exciting to have a methodology that is effective in this, aside from saying, okay, go down to this clinic and you can get this pill or you can try 12 steps or go to Narconon or do this. And maybe I think, let me just stop right there because I think getting one-on-one -on -one help and not having outside influences address with someone like yourself, just one-on-one -on -one address your own issues because like we are individual people that like we were talking about earlier, the effects are different that on us if we were to take something. So yeah. as a result on mm -hmm. what happens and so are the way that we respond to recovery.
So I like that you're able to do this one-on-one -on -one versus um, somebody going, and I'm not saying that that's not effective for somebody. I'm just saying I really like the individualism in being able to address someone's issues one-on-one. -on -one. I agree with you. I, I don't um, think that the group sessions are bad either because of that sense of belonging, if they're bonding, you know, with other people maybe who, but I think that it's so necessary to have the one-on-one -on -one mm -hmm. if possible as well. So I think both can be effective, but some people absolutely don't like the group stuff, you know, just yes. it doesn't work for them. Yes. So, and the one thing that I found when I, you know, just working with trauma victims over all of these years people don't like sharing with too many people their personal stuff. It's embarrassing. It's humiliating. They feel like they've made poor choices. They don't want to be judged for the choices that they've made. They want to get out of the situation, get healthy and make that part of the past and move beyond. So when they work one-on-one yeah. -on -one with somebody and they share that and then they've moved forward, it's kind of like a closed chapter and nobody else has to know. Whereas when more people know that's the potential of other people outside of that happening to find out. And so, um, so it's really interesting. I do, I do like what you're doing. I really think that this is absolutely incredible work. I can't wait to see what more you're going to be doing. And in the meantime, I think that the audience needs to see the 16 movie. How do they see this? So you can go to the website. It's www.the16movie.com. We can post the link. So the website's there, the trailer's on there. You'll see the two minute trailer there. Um, you can see the 10 minute trailer obviously at my events. And we've had a bunch of screenings. I'm not sure that we'll do more screenings per se, but we'll definitely be doing more events at colleges and conferences or around around the probably the east coast of the u.s for now where they can join us and see and see um the 10 minute version which is very powerful and it tells the story it tells the story of all the kids and shows it shows the path that they go down so it's it's very effective when dealing with students because they're usually like oh, this by the end and mm -hmm. some of them in tears because they probably can relate because they probably most of them know somebody, like I said, a lot of them raised their hands who've been affected. So it hits close to home for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And for any of your speaking engagements or for somebody that wants to work with you one-on-one, -on -one, how do they get in contact with you? Yeah, sure. They can email me at jessicagpetrovic at gmail.com. We can post a link for that too, but they can just email me directly if, they, if they're interested in hypnosis, NLP, a combination, um, events, public speaking, you know, coaching of any kind. If they, if they feel they need to be coached or talked through something that they're going through in their lives. Uh, one of my events with my partner, Brandon Dawson, he was the Dean of Elmira College. We're, we're working on a new event coming up in October about taking control back of your mind, of course, as we were discussing earlier, and how to rewire your brain. So we were doing a lot of that as well. So yeah, they can email me directly for, for any, you know, any type of questions, conversation, bookings, anything really. I love it. Thank you so much for all that you're doing to really get out there and help people who need this so desperately. Thank you so much for having me on your show and giving me a platform to share this with even more people you know it's amazing to see communities come together and support this type of stuff and i've been really lucky that i shot my the trailer of the 16 in my hometown where i went to high school and literally the entire community came together to help oh. me with it they were incredible i couldn't have done it without them it was i owe them so much i have so much gratitude towards them and it was amazing to go back after 20 years and you know do something like that and have everybody a part of it. So oh, cool. this, this is so neat. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'm so glad we had a chance to do this today. So I'm looking forward to, to more chats about, I don't know. We have so many topics that we, <laughs> we touched on Me the too. other day.
we do yeah. but we'll be back on because we we definitely have a lot more to talk about and we definitely have more to share with those out there who can use some of these things that the tools and resources that you and I have so we got to get them out there excellent i'm all for it thank you so much rebecca Oh, I just love it, Jessica. Ooh. All right. And I want to thank all of you for tuning in today. Please make sure that you get connected with Jessica and tune in to the 16 movie. You've got to see this yourself. You've got to get this in the hands of everybody that you know. Get it out on social media. As always, I should tell you, share this episode with your friends, your family, your loved ones, everybody you know on social media and those you don't. This is important. This is a critical time that we're living in. We are seeing drug usage, opioid usage on unprecedented levels. Just share it. Let's get it out there and let's see what we can do to impact this in a really positive way. Thanks for tuning in.